commentaries on the four last books of Moses, arranged in the form of a harmony. Volume 4 by John Calvin Numbers 16, verses 16 to 34. And Moses said unto Korah, Be thou and all thy company before the Lord, thou and they and Aaron, to morrow. And take every man his censer, and put incense in them. And bring ye before the Lord every man his censer, two hundred and fifty censers, thou also and Aaron, each of you his censer. And they took every man his censer, and put fire in them, and laid incense thereon, and stood in the door of the tabernacle of the congregation with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell upon their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses rose up, and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. So they gat them up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram on every side. And Dathan and Abiram came out, and stood in the door of their tents, and their wives, and their sons, and their little children. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth, and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods. They, and all that appertained to them, went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. Verse 16. And Moses said unto Korah, The idea of Moses is not to make an experiment as if in a doubtful matter, but, being assured by the spirit of prophecy what the event would be, he summons Korah before the tribunal of God, that he may receive the sentence of condemnation which he deserves. Nor does he inveigle him so as to destroy him unawares, but rather still endeavors to cure his madness if it were possible to do so. For the sacred incense offering was calculated to inspire him with alarm, lest by rashly attempting more than was lawful, he should effect his own destruction, especially after so memorable an example had been made in the case of Nadab and Abihu. Moses, however, in reliance on God's command, does not hesitate to engage in an open contest in order that the judgment of God might be the more conspicuous. 18. And they took every man his censer. It is manifest how greatly they were blinded by pride, since although admonished both by the confidence of Moses and also by the previous examples, they still obstinately go forward. Surely if any spark of the fear of God had remained in them, 
their censers would straightway have fallen from their hands. But Korah seems to have sought, as it were, deliberately how he might cast aside all fear and totally bereave himself of his senses. For in the next verse, Moses narrates how ostentatiously he hardened himself in his rebellion before he should offer the incense. For he gathered the people together to his party, in order that the magnificence of his array might overwhelm the grace of God which opposed him. Herein also his senselessness is clearly seen when he seeks to fortify himself against God by the favor of the mob, as if he had desired to extinguish the light of the sun by interposing a little smoke. Now let us learn so to condemn his folly, as that nothing similar may happen in ourselves. For all ambitious persons are affected by the same disease. They collect their forces by endeavoring to ingratiate themselves with men, and if the world approves of them, they are inebriated with such fatal confidence as to spit of the very clouds. But we shall soon see how God, by a single breath, dissipates all their ungodly conspiracies. On the other side, the levity of the people is set before our eyes. For some time they had been all accustomed to the duty-appointed priesthood, which they knew to be instituted by God, yet only a single night is required to make them revolt to Korah. And in fact, as we are by nature slow to act aright, so also we are carried away to evil in a moment, as soon as some villain lifts up his finger. 21. Separate yourselves from among this congregation. Again does God declare that he will bear the people's great impiety no longer, but will destroy them all to a man. Just therefore, as he had commanded Lot to depart from Sodom, nay, had drawn him out by the hand of the angel when he desired to destroy that city, so he now commands Moses and Aaron to give him room to exercise his wrath. In this he declares his extraordinary favor towards them, as if he were not free to execute vengeance until they had gone out of the way, lest the destruction should reach themselves. In speaking thus, however, he does not absolutely affirm what he had determined in a secret council, but only pronounces what the authors of this wickedness had deserved. It is, therefore, just as if he were ascending his judgment seat. Thus Moses by his intercession by no means changed his eternal decree, but by appeasing him delivered the people from the punishment they had merited. In the same sense God is said to be influenced by our prayers, not that after the manner of men he assumes new feelings, but in order to show the more than paternal love with which he honors us, he, as it were, indulges us when he listens to our desires. Hence we gather that even by this express denunciation, Moses was not prohibited from praying, because his faith in the adoption of the people was not destroyed. For we have already said that this principle, that the covenant which God had made with Abraham could not be made void, was so thoroughly engraven upon his mind that it surmounted whatever obstacles might present themselves. Resting, therefore, on the gratuitous promise which depended not on men, his prayer was the offspring of faith. For the saints do not always reason accurately and subtly as to the form of their prayers, but after they have once embraced that which suffices to awaken in them confidence in prayer, that is, God's word, their whole attention is so directed to it that they pass over the things which seem apparently to contradict it. Nor can we doubt but that it was God's design, when he delivered his terrible sentence as to the destruction of the people, to quicken the earnestness of Moses in prayer, since necessity more and more inflames the zeal of the pious. In short, Moses was always consistent in his care for the well-being of the people. 22. O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh! 
The old interpreter renders the first ale as an adjective in which some others have followed him. But, in my opinion, the name of God is rather repeated by way of adding force to the sentence. It does not, however, so clearly appear to me why all render the word flesh in the genitive case. But since I do not think that the lamed is superfluous here, but that it is used for bait, as often elsewhere, I have accurately expressed the sense by my translation, in all flesh. There is no question but that Moses applies this epithet to God in connection with the present matter. As if he desired to induce God to preserve his own work, just as a potter spares the vessels formed by himself. To the same effect is the prayer of Isaiah. But now, O Lord, thou art our Father, we are the clay, and thou art potter, and we are all the work of thy hand. Be not wroth very sore. Isaiah 64, 8 and 9. For hence he alleges a reason why God should relent and be inclined to mercy. There is this difference that Isaiah refers to that special grace wherewith God had embraced his people, whereas Moses carries his address further, that is, to the general grace of creation. It is of little importance whether we choose to expound this with reference to animals or only to the human race, since Moses merely prays that, since God is the creator and maker of the world, he should not destroy the men whom he has formed, but rather have pity upon them as being his work. In passing, however, we may infer from this passage that all men have their separate souls, for God is not said to have inspired all flesh with life, but to have created their spirits. Hence the monstrous delusion of the Manichaeans is refuted, that our souls are so infused by the transmission of the Spirit of God as that there should still be only one spirit. But if it be preferred to include the animals, we must mark the grades of distinction between the spirit of man and the spirit of a dog or an ass. It is, however, more fitting to restrict it to men. 24. Speak unto the congregation, saying. It is evident from this answer that Moses was heard as regarded the general preservation of the people, on condition, however, that they should give proof of their repentance by deserting the authors of the wicked rebellion. For when God commands them to retire from amongst them, he indirectly implies that if they remain mixed up with them, they shall share in the same destruction. Yet it is probable that the elders who followed Moses held to his side and continued firm in the performance of their duty. And indeed, it is not at all consistent that Caleb and Joshua, and such like, were ever drawn away into so great a sin. We must not therefore take what is said of the whole congregation without exception. When Moses, in his delivery of God's command, does not address Korah, Dathan, and Abiram by their names, but calls them these wicked men, it is not the reviling of anger, but an urgent mode of exhortation. For had he not thus vehemently marked his detestation of them, there was danger lest his word should have been but coldly received by many, and lest they should have been of little avail. To the same effect also is what he immediately adds, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. As if he had said, lest the contagion of so many and such great crime should infect yourselves. Since they obeyed Moses, it is plain that many of the multitude had been carried away before by folly and levity, for deliberate iniquity would not have been so quickly or so easily corrected. But on the other hand, the marvelous stolidity of Dathan and Abiram is described in that they came forth unawed with their wives and children. Still, it is not to be doubted, but they were terrified after they saw themselves to be stripped of all aid and favor. But although the withdrawal of the people disturbed them, they nevertheless stood like maniacs, nor did fear subdue them or prevent them from proceeding in their fatal audacity to their doom. 
Thus do the wicked often stand astounded, yet in their fear they by no means think of appeasing God. 28. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know. Moses now begins more clearly to show wherefore he has brought the rebels to this open contest, that is, that God may sanction before the whole people, by a terrible exertion of his power, the system established by himself. For it was no ordinary effort of confidence to concede the victory to his enemies, unless the earth should swallow them up alive. But inasmuch as this was to be a most conspicuous judgment of God, he arouses their attention by the striking words he uses. If they should be cut off by a sudden death, he would have justly boasted that his cause was approved by God. But, not content with this, he desires to be accounted a mere impostor, if they should die the common death of men. In order to express the strangeness of the miracle, whereby men's senses should be ravished, he employs the word create emphatically, as much as to say that the mode of their death would be no less unusual than as if God should add something to his creation and change the face of the world. Thus David, when he prays that his enemy should go down alive into hell or the grave, seems to allude to this history. Psalm 55.23 For although that descent be understood to mean sudden death overtaking the wicked in a moment in the midst of their happiness and security, still he at the same time indicates by it this horrible retribution which had occurred in times past, inasmuch as memorable punishments pass into proverbial instances of God's wrath. 34. And all Israel that were round about them. We must suppose that the people were standing around, expecting at a distance the event that was to take place. For they had previously retired from the tents in token of their separation from this wicked company that they should now fly in confusion, lest the same destruction should overwhelm themselves, is a sign of their bad conscience, which is always troubled in itself, and agitates the wicked with sore inquietude. It is needful, indeed, that even the pious should be alarmed by God's judgments, in order that their consternation or dread should instruct them in his holy fear. And therefore they never reflect without dread on the punishments which God had inflicted upon the crimes of men. But since hypocrites carry in their hearts a hot iron, as it were, they fall down like dead men, as if the lightning fell from God upon their own heads. Thus we shall presently see that this blind fear profited them but little. This audio recording was read by Michael Ives. I hope you found it enlightening and edifying. Visit westportexperiment.com for more audio resources, and where I write about parish missions, the care of souls, and all things reformed.